called That Thing We Do, and uh, as we walk through this series, we're just asking the question, I wonder why we do that. You ever ask that question? You ever, you ever realize that sometimes we just do stuff and we really don't, don't even know why we do it? I wonder, wonder why we do it that way. I wonder, I wonder if there's a better way. I wonder, I wonder if, do I just do this because it's all I've ever known? And uh, some things are a little more, um, I guess they're a little more sacred than just saying, I wonder if there's a better way. Um, but still, we should answer the question because some of you are new to MacArthur. Some of you um, come from different backgrounds. Some of you have never been in church in your whole life, and just recently you've started coming, or you've just recently been saved. And so it's not like you just have a long history of understanding why uh, people do what they do. You know, you just kind of come into the crowd, and everybody stands up and you say, Oh, well, it's time for me to stand up now. Okay. Everybody sits down. Well, it's time for me to sit down now. And that's okay. And so in this series, um, we're talking. Not only to those of you who are new to MacArthur or new to church period, but maybe some of you have been here so long that you just kind of have gotten in the routine of doing something and you haven't really thought about it recently. And sometimes it's good to go back to the basics basics and rethink about it and have the Lord kind of solidify some things in your heart. Today I want to talk to you about the Holy Spirit. Because as a a Pentecostal church, um, not only is uh, the presence of the Holy Spirit very real and powerful and important to us, but the operation of the Holy Spirit is very powerful to us. Now, one of the things that I love about our church is kind of a melting pot. People come from all different kinds of backgrounds. Um, maybe you came here from a different kind of church, and, and it wasn't from a Pentecostal or charismatic background, and, and so um, when I talk about this today, you might have eyebrows raised and more question marks than, than really answers. That's okay, because I more than anything, I just want to preach to you the word and let the word of God speak life to you. And then you decide where you are in that. But I, I believe that um, the Lord will uh, do something special in your heart and life with in you today. So I'm, I'm very grateful for a heritage that we have as a movement. That is a movement of power. It's a movement of missions. This movement that we're involved in from the very beginning has been a a movement that said, you know what, this isn't about us. We are called to go into all the world and preach the gospel of Jesus because there are people who have not heard, and if we don't go, how will they hear? And they understood from the beginning in 1914 in Hot Springs, Arkansas, where this movement began, and it's been moving ever since, and it's still moving strong around the world. From the very beginning, they understood that if we're going to do what we're called to do, we have to walk in the power of God. This calling and this this thing that God has called us to do is so much bigger than we are. It's so much more, it takes so much more power than we possess. So we have to look to God for the ability to do what he's called us to do. And don't you think that if God says, I want you to do this, he will provide you with the ability or the power or the, whatever it takes or whatever you need to accomplish it. And so this movement, and I'm, I'm speaking of the Assemblies of God, I don't want to get all denominational because I don't like that whole denominational thing. I don't like that feel. I, I just like the fact that we're a movement of people who believe in the power of God and believe in touching people's lives with the message of the gospel, no matter if they look like us, smell like us, live like, live like we do, live where we do. Let's take the gospel into all the world because it isn't that the heartbeat of Jesus? So I'm very thankful for this heritage, and it began in Hot Springs, 1914, with a group of people that said, we believe that God has called us to make a difference in all the earth, and if we're going to do that, then we need to walk in the power of God. You see, the Lord has called us to go into all the earth, Matthew 28, go into all the world and preach the good news. That's you, and that's me. It's not just for the disciples. It's not just for a group of believers in the, Old, in the New Testament. It's not just, you know, for, for them back in the day. That's for us to go into all the world and preach the gospel of Jesus Christ. You say, Pastor Mark, I'm not a preacher. Oh, yes, you are. Every one of our lives preach, preach messages every day. 
The way we walk, the way we talk, the way we interact, the way we react sometimes. You know what I'm saying? We're, we're preaching a message every day. The, the way that we uh, walk in relationship with people, we have opportunity to preach the gospel every day to our neighbors, to the people down the street, to our city. We are preaching the gospel. You are a minister of the gospel of Jesus Christ if you know him. And so when we're called to go into all the world and preach the gospel... This is not just a calling to vocational ministers. This is a calling to all of us to walk in the power of God and to share the message of the life-changing message of Jesus with all who will hear. And so that starts right here in our, in our um, back door. And I, I just want to say today, when we're talking about the power of the Holy Spirit, we believe that there is a, that you receive the Holy Spirit when you're saved, but there's a subsequent experience beyond that. And you can see that in the book of Acts. We'll look at it in just a minute. There's a subsequent experience after you've believed, then there is a greater measure of the Holy Spirit given at that point. And that greater measure is given so that we, will, we can do what God has called us to do. It, it, I look at it like this. If, if you're, if you're um, offering me my choice of an S, a 1980, uh, 1987 S10 pickup truck that runs okay and you hand me the keys, or I can have that, or... I can have a 2015 um, jacked up about 8 inches on 33s, uh, Nitto tires with a big V8 engine and uh, has all the bells and whistles, uh, Z71 Chevrolet. Now, which one am I going to take? Somebody said the S10 because I can't get in that big one. (laughs) Uh, Well, no. I'm a man, man. I'm a manly man. I want to drive the big truck. I want to make some noise. I want to, I want to go through some mud. You know what I'm saying? I want, the, I want the most that I can get out of the experience. If I'm going to offer you a, a, a little cheeseburger or a T-bone steak, which one are you going to take? You're going to take the, the bigger and the better because that's what we want. If you're going to give me something, give me all of it. And that's what I say about this experience that we have. And, and listen, you don't have to be baptized in the Holy Spirit to go to heaven. It's not a heaven or hell issue. It's not something that God forces on people. This isn't something that, you know, if you're a part of a church that believes this way, then you just have to be that. No one's looking down their nose. As a matter of fact, I want to be be very clear and be sure that we're not a church that thinks we're better because we have uh, the infilling or the, the fullness of the Spirit of God or the baptism of the Holy Spirit. But we're just, we receive the grace gifts that God pours out and anybody can have them. We're not special. So, To give you a little bit of background on this whole idea of the baptism of the Holy Spirit, Jesus says in John chapter number 16, Jesus says, Nevertheless, I tell you the truth, it's to your advantage that I go away. He's preparing his disciples. He said, I'm going to go away. I've been with you for these three and a half years, but it's going to be to your advantage that I go away. Why would he say that? For if, if I don't go away, the helper, he's speaking of the Holy Spirit, the helper will not come to you, but if I go, I will send him. Another comforter, uh, the helper who will come alongside. That word parakletos, the the, the counselor, the the one who comes alongside to help. Jesus said, it's it's actually going to be better because when I get up in the morning and I go out to pray, I'm no longer with you. But there's coming a day when I send the Holy Spirit, he will be in you and with you at all times. It's going to be better for you that I go away when he would die and go to heaven, he's speaking of. He says, it's going to be better. Now, if you have your Bible, let's, let's look at our text today in Acts chapter 1, verse, verses 8 through 11. And then I'm going to quickly give you five reasons why I believe everyone should be baptized in the Holy Spirit. Five reasons. You look around, you say, why, why would we put such emphasis on the Holy Spirit here? Why is it such a big deal that we're a Pentecostal church? It's a big deal because it's something that God gives you. You don't have to receive it, but you get to if you want to. And I believe it's important for our lives. Acts chapter 1, verse 8, the Bible says... So when they had come together, they asked him, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? And he said to them, it's not for you to know the times or the seasons the Father has fixed by his own authority. Let me just stop right there and say, there has always been lots of speculation about the times and the seasons of life, about when the, you know, certain things were going to come to pass. There's always been a lot of speculation. The reality is we don't know. But the fact that we don't know says we should live right now. Like this could be the moment when Jesus returns, when this is the season of his return. We should live right now. And I would say that we're just living in some days when you can look around and tell that there's some shaking going on in our world. 
And it's time that we live like we need to be living. It's time that we're ready for the return of Christ. It's time that if you have sin in your life, it's not time to play games. We don't know when the seasons are. I'm not going to stand in the pulpit and tell you it's going to be on this day or this month. I mean, the Lord just hasn't given me that kind of insight. And I don't know. You know, there's been a lot of people who've said stuff. But Jesus says here, it's, it's not time for you to know. That's not for you to know. But then in verse 8, he says, but you're not supposed to know that. But listen, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. And you'll be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and in Samaria and to the ends of the earth. And when he said these things, as they were looking on, he was lifted up in, in a cloud and took, taken out of their sight. And when they were gazing into heaven, as he went, behold, two men stood by them in white robes and said to the men of Galilee, why do you stand looking into heaven? And Jesus, who is taken up from you into heaven, will come in the same way that you saw him go into heaven. Now, skip over one chapter. I know I'm reading some, uh, some long, lengthy texts, but you need this. Acts chapter 2, verse 1. Jesus said, I want you to go and I want you to wait. Wait in Jerusalem. And, and he, notice he didn't say, I want you to wait for an outpouring of manifestations. Whatever that may look like. He said, I don't want you to go. He, he did not say, I want you to go and wait until you fall out in power. He didn't say, I want you to go and wait until you speak in tongues. He didn't say, I want you to go and wait until you tremble. He didn't say, I want you to go. and He said, I want you to go and wait until you're endued with power. Understand me today, church. The physical evidence, the, the initial physical evidence of, of being baptized in the Holy Spirit is speaking in tongues. But we don't seek the tongues just so that we can say that we have arrived at that point. We seek power. We seek God. He's the giver. We seek him for the power that he has for us to live the lives that he's called us to live. And as we seek that, he will pour the power into our lives. There, there may be some manifestation, but in that manifestation, we don't get caught up in the manifestation. It's the, the gift of power that he gives. Acts 2, verse 1. Look at there with me. When the day of Pentecost arrived, and listen, the day of Pentecost was a celebration. It wasn't just, the, Pentecost is not just about this outpouring, although it's what it's been marked by. It's the day of Pentecost. They were already having this celebration. And, and uh, when the day of Pentecost arrived, they were all together in one, apla- in one place. And suddenly there came from heaven um, a sound like a mighty rushing wind. And it filled the entire house where they were sitting And divided tongues as a fire appeared on them and rested on each one of them. And they were filled with the Holy Spirit and they began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. And now there were dwelling in Jerusalem devout men of every nation under heaven. And this sound, at this sound, the multitude came together and they were bewildered. Notice, they were bewildered because each one they heard was speaking in his own language. And they were amazed and astonished saying, are these not, are not all of these who were speaking Galileans? And now, and how is this that we hear each of us in his own native tongue? Okay, notice that the Bible says they were bewildered and, and they began to, to question what was going on. If you continue to read on, they start saying these men are drunk. And I just want you to see from the very beginning, from the very first uh, Pentecostal outpouring experience, on the day of Pentecost when God poured out his power, from that moment on there, was people, there were people who misunderstood misrepresented. I want to be very careful today to say that I don't believe that, that God calls us to step into a bunch of woo-woo weird stuff just for the sake of being weird. But I do believe that God does things sometimes that we can't understand in our rationality. You can't reason them out. I mean, as you look through the scriptures, why would Jesus spit in the mud and wipe spittle mud on a guy's eyes? That would be offensive, right? Why did he do that? He did it because we can't always understand why he does the things he does. Why would, why would he, you know, use uh, Elijah in, in, in defense? Why, why didn't God just pour out his, his power in a, you know, some different way instead of uh, the way he did it there with the fire and the, and the, before the prophets of Baal? I don't understand why God always did the things he did. And, and I don't understand the way he always does things the way he does them today. And it's not really up to me to comprehend or understand because at some point we have to trust that God is and that he's the rewarder of those who diligently seek him and that if God wants to do it that way, he can do it that way. The Bible's very clear that, 
God's ways are higher than our ways. His thoughts are higher than our thoughts. As high as the heavens are above the earth, so great are his thoughts above our thoughts and his ways above our ways. So let's stop trying to fit God in our rational box and realize that there are sometimes... He doesn't call us to be weird for weird's sake, but there are some times when God makes us step out of our comfort zone in order to do what he wants to do in our lives. And so when it comes to this issue of the baptism of the Holy Spirit, there's no way that I have time today to teach you the doctrine. I I, I don't have time to go through all of the the, the scriptures to, to lay a foundation for you. I hope today my intention is to whet your appetite. As you're looking around saying, why is it such a big deal that this is a Pentecostal church? Why is it when we're worshiping, sometimes I'll hear someone speaking in tongues, maybe in their own worship time. Why is it that sometimes a service stops and someone will give a message in tongues and interpretation? Why, why is that? I want to help later and be able to answer all of those questions that you might have. We're going to be having a, a class on the Holy Spirit. Nothing's going to jump on you in this class. If, if you're new to this deal, listen, this is a very safe environment. I'm trying to show you today by not getting too worked up and riled up and spitting and stomping that, that we can talk about this without foaming at the mouth. Right? And, and I don't mean that offensive in any way. I'm just saying, I, I want you to understand that, that this is, this is a, a, a very uh, touchy topic for some people. But it's who we are, and we embrace the moving of God's Spirit. So, in the lobby, in the lobby, there is a sign-up. It's red. I have it red on purpose because I want you to be able to find it. If you're interested, there's no dates yet, but if you're interested in the baptism of the Holy Spirit, in the gifts of the Spirit, the operation of the Holy Spirit, and you would like to know more, you would like to understand scripturally where we come from in our doctrine on the baptism of the Holy Spirit, and then even at the end, if you would like to receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit, we'll have a a time when we pray for you specifically. You don't have to, but you get to if you want to. Then find the red sheet at the information desk because we want to involve you in that class so that we can teach you uh, systematically why we believe what we believe. Because concerning this issue... I think it's kind of like people look at Arkansans because we've been misrepresented by so many. Listen, there are so many extremes out there that you just catch something on TV and you're like, oh, that's who those people are. Okay. That's what they do to Arkansans. That's what they do to Pentecostals. We've been misrepresented. We've been misunderstood. This is something that God meant for your benefit. It's a gift. It's a gift of his grace and it's a good thing. So, I, can't, I don't have time today to dig into to, to all of that. That's why we're going to have the class. But I, I want to whet your appetite today. Why would, you, why would you need the baptism of the Holy Spirit? What's the, what's the reasoning for being baptized in the Holy Spirit? I'm just going to give you uh, four. And, and if, I mean, I could give you a whole lot more, but I think these are very applicable to us today. So, four important reasons to seek the baptism in the Holy Spirit in our day. The first one is this. You have an impossible task. You have an impossible task. The Great Commission, when Jesus said, go into all the world and preach the gospel. Wow, go into all the world and preach the gospel. And and, and that's not just for the apostles. That's not just for the disciples. That's that's for me. Yeah, that's for you. Listen, Jesus gave that command. He he gave that commission. He gave the Great Commission. And then uh, right before he went into heaven, he said, look, I want you to go and I want you to wait. Because when I leave here, you're going to need some power. I'm not going to be with you anymore. You're going to need the power to be and do what I've called you to be and do. And so when Jesus ascends to heaven, they're standing there looking and some angels come along and they're just kind of stargazing like, I can't believe he just left us. I can't believe he's gone into heaven. And they're just standing gazing. Some angels come along and they say, what are you looking at? Why is your eye in the sky? Don't you realize he gave you work to do? And it, just like he left, he's going to return. So let's get busy uh, until he returns. And so you have an impossible task. The Great Commission is on all of our shoulders. It's time for us to take it as our responsibility to stop living life like it's just about us and our four and no more. Who are you taking to heaven with you? This life is more than just making a paycheck or, or, or earning a, a living. It's about living life to make a difference and take some people to heaven with us. 
I want you today to, to take some responsibility and to, to take personal the commissioning that, that Jesus gave with the Great Commission to go into all the world and preach the good news. But when you think about that, you might think, well, me? Me? That's what the disciples thought too. As a matter of fact, in Acts chapter number 2, the first part of the chapter, there's kind of a roll call of disciples. There's 11 of them there. We know that there were 120 in the upper room, but there were 11 of those disciples. Judas has already betrayed Jesus. They were just about to elect a new guy to take his place. But 11 disciples there that are, that are called. And I could go down the list and talk to you about the failures and faults and the weaknesses of every one of those men. Can I tell you, Jesus was saying to those men, I choose you to change this world. Because it's not about you. It's about the power of the gospel and the power of the Holy Spirit. When those two intersect, you've got a recipe to make a difference in somebody's life. That's why a guy like Simon Peter, who didn't have the strength, the gumption, or the courage to stand up for the one he loved as he stood around a campfire waiting to see what was going to happen to Jesus. And he betrayed him and and, and totally uh, uh, abandoned him and said, I don't even know the man. Bible says that Simon Peter's eyes caught the eyes of Jesus as Jesus turned right at the moment that he, he, he denied him the third time. And can't you imagine the, the, the feeling of failure in Simon Peter's heart? That's the, the man that after being empowered and, and, and filled with the spirit in the book of Acts chapter number two, right after that, Simon Peter preaches his first message and thousands of people are saved. The one who didn't have the power or the gumption to stand up for him now is standing up saying, no, 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 it's not like you think it is. We're talking, this is the power of God falling on these people. They're not drunk. I know you think they're crazy and I know they've been misrepresented, but I'm telling you, this is the power of God. Now, who wants to know him? All kinds of people gave their, I mean, the first day it became a mega church, 3,000 people, just like that. Hear people saying, I don't like big churches. Well, you're probably not going to like heaven. It's going to be a big church. The church has been big from the beginning. I'm just telling you. You have an impossible task. You have an impossible. It is impossible by your means. But God has not called you to, to, to do it on your own. The outpouring of the Holy Spirit on the day of Pentecost was given at that point for all believers to latch on to and take part of from that point on. And the Lord is saying, I'm giving you this because you need it, because you can't do what I've called you to do by yourself. That is why you need to be baptized in the Holy Spirit. The second thing I want you to see today, you have an imperative message. You have an imperative message. Listen, it's so important that we preach the message of Jesus. It's so important that we, we don't just, you know, love people so long that they don't even know what we stand for. But at some point, we tell them about Jesus. The good news, listen, the good news confronts sin and, and tells about the, the, the saving grace of Christ. And I know it's confrontational to to speak about sin, but sin is sin. Let's call it what it is. Sin will damn people to hell if they don't get it right, if they don't don't understand what the effect of sin is in their lives. So let's love them enough to say, this is the sin in your life. I love you. But listen, the the free gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ. And we don't earn it, but it's it's the free gift that he pours into our lives because of what he has done. We receive the forgiveness and and the freedom from the wrath of God for our sin. You have an imperative message. Don't think it's up to the preacher to preach Jesus. It's all of our responsibility. There are people in your life that I can never speak to because they won't listen to me. He's put you in their circle so that you can share Jesus with them. You need, the third reason, you need impeccable character. You say, whoa, wait a minute. But you said the disciples were were weak and failures. They were. I didn't say perfect. The word impeccable is intriguing. I looked it up and I thought, man, how how good is this? This is perfect for what we're talking about. Impeccable means above suspicion. It doesn't mean perfect. It's not that you're going to get it right all the time, but to the best of our ability and with the spirit of God living in us, we need to be people of character. Do you know why the world looks at the church today and laughs? Do you know why people are open and hungry for Jesus, but they don't want anything to do with the church? Because the church has said one thing in the building and lived something different on the outside. And that's not me throwing stones because I'm, I'm weak and I'm broken myself. I've failed so often. When Jesus said, I, I want you to be in due with power so that you can be witnesses unto me in Jerusalem, right there where you live, and Judea, 
in Samaria and to the ends of the earth? You know what he was saying? When he said, I want you to be a witness, he was saying, I want you to represent me well. I want you to not only tell them with your lips, but show them with your life who I am. When we wear this name Christian, we wear the name of Christ. You know what a witness, when a witness is on the stand and in a, in a, in a trial, the, the, the defense is automatic or, or the, the, uh, the one trying to, to, to come against the, the witness is trying to take away their character, trying to cause suspicion in a jury. If there's any suspicion at all, then, then they can have a case or, or they can break the case. What the enemy does is he's an accuser. He He hurls insults. He accuses. He lies. He wants to break down your witness because if your witness breaks down, then your message isn't as powerful. This isn't today a a message to try to put pressure on you to be something that you can't be. This is a message to say the Lord wants to give you power to be more than you can be. Power to be the witness that he's called you to be. Power to to overcome that natural tendency you have. Power to to not do what you naturally do. Power to not speak like you normally would speak or react like you normally would react. So that your witness can, can be a witness of Christ. That's good preaching. You need impeccable character. And the last thing today, the last reason that you need to seek the baptism of the Holy Spirit besides the fact that it's biblical, is that there's an imminent return. There's an imminent return. And when I say imminent, I mean imminent. Maybe there's an urgently imminent return. I don't set dates, and I I wouldn't do anything to cause anybody to fear. I'm just telling you, you don't have to look very far to realize that we're living in the last days. It's not just the direction of our culture. It's worldwide. I mean, it, there are things lying, lining up from Bible prophecy. It, it's just amazing. There are prophetic words that have been given through great godly men like David Wilkerson that are, are lining up with the days that we are living in. And I'm just, I'm just here today to say to you, you need the baptism of the Holy Spirit because now more than ever, in the midst of a culture that is godless, in the midst of a culture that is hurling insults at God and everything that that pertains to God, you know what you need? You need the power to stand in moments like that. And I'm speaking for you as an individual, but for us collectively too. We don't need to come into this building and go through religious routines because there are people here right now under the sound of my voice. You're hurting on the inside. You're dying and desperate. You don't need a preacher to to, to stand up and, and preach to you or, or speak to you some rehearsed message that sounds good. What you need is somebody to offer you hope in Jesus and the power of God to make a difference in your life. And that's what the world around us needs from me and from you. The return of Jesus is soon. And I, I believe that we should be at work. We should be making a difference so that, that we can take people with us, so that people are prepared, so that the people that we love are prepared, but also so that we can face these last days in in, in strength and in power. We don't have to cower to culture. We don't have to, to back down and be afraid. God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind.